relevant to the officiating ceremony's work and legacy. It is relevant in two ways. Dr. Tilut Shelvam was one of those, uh, you know, maybe few lawyers who adopted an interdisciplinary and intersectional approach to both his legal practice and scholarship. The institutions which he founded, the Law and Society Trust, and the International Center for Ethnic Studies are further testimony to this fact. He focused not only on the law, but on the socio-political and economic elements that shaped law and were shaped by the law. And he recognized that law too is a system of power that discriminates and marginalizes people. In Sri Lanka, issues related to poverty and inequality are often discussed through a development of a framework that is depoliticized and dehistoricized. Sri Lanka is also the best example of development in convenience on human rights and inequality, which ultimately diminishes our ability to effect social change. For instance, the language we use or choose not to use results in the problems being hidden rather than being brought in focus. We are constantly trying to package you know, equality, social justice, and human rights in palatable models in ways we think might be acceptable to those in positions of power while ignoring systemic and structural problems. In a deeply divided society such as Sri Lanka, this exacerbates conflict and deepens existing social, political, and economic inequalities and cleavages. Our failed strategies are also a reflection of how we imagine development. For example, those in positions of power, that is governments, politicians, the corporate sector, imagine our cities as all skyscrapers and chrome and glass, while ignoring, if not denying, social justice demands. Development initiatives such as the beautification of Colombo, initiated by Gautabi Rajapaksa when he was secretary to the Ministry of Defense, resulted in the displacement of large communities who lost their lands and livelihoods. These communities often tend to be those who have experienced historical marginalization and discrimination and continue to be placed on the margins of society, economically, socially, and legally. Cities can also be constructed to enable authoritarian rule by shutting down public spaces, by constructing panopticons to facilitate hyper-state surveillance, and structures that allow easy policing and crackdown on dissent. They can therefore be sites of abuse and violence such as the 1983 riots, of which we mark the 40th anniversary this year. So you can see how Gotham's lecture today, which interrogates poverty, inequality, violence, and power through the lens of the city, speaks to the issues that were at the core of Dr. Tiruchelvan's work and to our current, or should I say, continuing reality. Gotham is the associate dean the School of Human Development, as well as senior lead academics and research at the School of Human Development at the Indian Institute for Human Settlements in Bangalore. He holds a PhD in city and regional planning uh, from the University of California, Berkeley. At the IIHS, Gotham teaches, researches, and writes on the politics of urban poverty and inequality, urban and planning theory, housing, identity, and social practice. He anchors IHS's work as a center for excellence with the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs, as well as a knowledge partner to urban movements for housing rights. As part of the School of Development, he also leads work on urban welfare regimes, so social protection, and informal work. New projects include work on child health outcomes for children, for informal workers in domestic work and construction, as well as advocacy work on urban, urban social protection regimes. He has also published widely. Most recently, he is the author of the In the Public's Interest, Eviction, Citizenship, and Inequality in Contemporary Delhi, and co-editor of the Routledge Companion to Planning in the Global South. Gautam is, is also a spokesperson for LGBTIQ rights 
and one of the petitioners in the legal battle to decriminalize homosexuality in India. Uh, please join me in welcoming Gautam. Someone has to build the stadiums. 
We don't often talk about someone who builds the stadiums and they have to come somewhere. So contractors put workers from across North India in trucks and they brought them to Delhi. They brought them to Delhi to build the stadiums of the Asian Games. And they told them, make a life here. 1976 to 1984. Thousands of people came. They filled in marshland with sand. They concretized. They laid the first sheets. They laid the first bricks. And they slowly began building homes. This is a very particular way in which cities in our part of the world are built. Most people don't move into a home with four walls and a tap and a door that much. Most people make their homes as they live in them. Our housing is mostly inseparable from our life. Brick by brick, wall by wall, election by election, land that does not belong to US property, which is a much more recognizable public question, but land that you claim, public land, as the public. And you build it slowly. And so they built. A generation was born. Ironically, this building is a registry of birth and death. When I swear I didn't do this just for the lecture, it really is the registry of birth and death. Sometimes cities offer you stories that add up. I reached here at 22 because I want to do development work as a new graduate in social sciences. And when you want to do development work, go to the bus, what we did. And when I was here, for a long time, I tried to understand what this place was. As an urbanist, my training tells me to look at the bus in very particular ways. It's a spatial form. It's materials, it's brick, it's tarpaulin. That spatial form is vulnerable. There is no denying its vulnerability. There are not individual toilets. There are not street lights. There is no asphalt. I would call this a precarious and vulnerable built environment. A problem to be faced. It is also a legal form because these are citizens who live on public land, but they don't own this land in fact. And so they live in a tension with the law. They live in a tension with the master plan. Yet they were placed here and their voter IDs are from here and their electricity meters are from here. Because election after election, the state negotiates how many rights to give that your workers will not need? But don't give too many rights because then they become property citizens who make claims. A dance of housing, of citizenship. And in my time, my doctoral work was still. The bus did change from me as a spatial material form into the place where social contracts station where citizenship is negotiated. Not a housing form, but a site where life, that famous right to life in the Indian constitution, life is made. And the thing about cities is that every time life is made and negotiated, it needs the ground underneath your feet. It needs a spatiality. There's something deeply urban that where you have rights is as important as what rights you have. The reason I also think of this, and I want you to think of this, not as a built environment, engineering problem, an architectural question, or the income poverty of these questions, but I want you to think of the word social contract when you think of the bus thing. Because when we start seeing our cities from particular sites and ask, what kind of social contract is this place? Those sites become ways to look at how our society and our social contracts are changing. They become places to see how, what it means to be a citizen, what it means to be a worker, what it means to be an urban resident is changing. And when I was 24, in 2004, with 150 policemen and reserves from our paramilitary units, the social contract shifted underneath my feet to the step. It was one of 276 addictions that we cataloged and documented. 
documented in Delhi between 1990 and 2007. In 2010, we held the Commonwealth Games. And ironically, eviction notices went to the same workers who had built the stadium of the Asian Games. The city of the cycle, in question of time. What was hard for me, and where the title of that book that I want to talk about came from, is that this eviction happened not through our government, but through our Supreme Court in what is ironically called a public interest litigation. And the question then is, is breaking the homes of 15,000 households, 60,000 people, is an act of public interest, then who is this public? In whose name is public interest being determined that an act of forced eviction can be seen not just as possible, but as fair, but as lawful, but as just. But of course, we know some of the greatest acts of violence in history are precisely lawful, are precisely by process. Then we had seen a similar set of evictions between 1975 and 1977 what we call the darkest hour of our democracy, the emergency, where our constitution was suspended under Indira. Evictions in the emergency made some kind of sense. We had let go of our fundamental rights. Evictions in the 2000s were democratically, legally, lawfully acts of government. The interesting story is what happened. This is the same site today, and where I ran up, and where I highway, and where the Center for Births and Legislation. Park, a riverside promenade, Utilization, urban transformation, visions of the city, where the incrementally built form of the worker cannot be part of your story, but leisure, a consumption, but aesthetics become powerful or not. This is also the spatialization of a social contract. But it's a social contract that imagines a very different kind of city. But cities are also, by definition, bigger than all of us. So, you remember, I told you that the water used to go right by the ramparts of the port in the 1700s. And if you look at the water here, this is the express where we live, the bridge remains the same. This is the train we always take when we come back at five in the morning from the hills, the way they to return from the mountains to see the red port and feel like the city has come, to come home. This is two weeks ago. Where shifting climate change means the river floods through the bus street, through the expressway, the first time in 150 years goes back to the port. And the headline ran, the Yamuna, a river, has taken back what was always its own. This is also a social contract. But the terms of this social contract are not just about the nation or the city. They are about an ecosystem and an environment. They're also a social contract with the urban and nature return to a position where they're not able to occupy the same space. I have often thought of the city like this. So one of my favorite artists, my name is Priya Ravish Mehra, and her work has this sense of layer, this sense of patchwork. You'll see a, a patch at the back material that I was intimately familiar with from my days in the bus city. You'll see that layer of indigo, the first round of repair, maybe six years in, after a particularly heavy rain, you'll see another layer of white. Cities concentrate opportunity. They also concentrate. And that's why the question of inequality is always one which will have to ask. Because cities do so, a 
across space and also across time. They layer different histories on top of each other, just like we are patchwork, never fully erasing any one of those layers, holding them all together. The water returns to a floodplain, but you cannot fully forget that the memory of that floodplain is in the bones of the asphalt of that expressway, no matter how much power you seek to exert on the city. It will always escape your intention. The best and worst thing about it. But what that means is that urban inequality is not inequality in the city. The urban is not a location, not a container. Inequality as a city. The forms of our urbanism, the history of the way our cities have been made, hold in them both the DNA of our current inequalities, but also our current equities and the hopes of where they may do things differently later. So I want to reframe the question. I want to ask what kind of social contract is the city? I don't want to think of the city as a planner as an engineer, as a geologist, as a hydrologist, as a transportation specialist, as a housing constructor, as a developer. I don't want to reduce the city to planning, architecture, design, and engineering. I want to think of the city as a fabric, a fabric that is deeply spatial, but also social, that is deeply material, but also political, that is deeply about every layer of what living here means, not just about how to control land and space. Whenever I tell Indians that I'm an urban planner, they always look at me and say, what do you do? Because Indian cities don't quite give a lot of confidence in our, let's say, planet. But the job of the planner is not to put things around like one of The job of the planner is to enmesh herself into the flows and logics of the city itself. My job as a planner is to push a new social contract in the city, to create possibilities of life and give them some spatial roots. And I'll tell you some stories about how. But what I want to hold here is that all that social contract is within competing regimes of value. Value understood by those that see the city as an economy, real estate prices, land aggregation, economic geography and development planning, the IT park, the special economic zone. Cities are fabrics of economic value. Others see them as places of leisure and culture and personhood and joy and desire. The city is a social fabric. The city is where we have been torn apart. It has also been where at moments we've been able to slowly thread and repair that fissure, that fabric, and come together. So the question is, if value is part of this social contract, which value do we need? Do I value the bus fee to the lives it held or to the exchange value of the price that public land now fetches because an expressway has been built? Is value economic or social? When the question of ecological value now enters, given climate change, how do I measure current economic value against future ecological value? The claims for future ecological value will depict people who are not yet born. If I think of my rights today to think about public land, it speaks for the generation not here but whose world is being shaped by what we consider value. So this to tension, what kind of a social contract is the city? What value or values does it hold? My invitation to you is to think from the city about inequality value. Think a city you know better. Not so unfamiliar. We're all here, we recognize where this is. May look a little different from the city you grew up in. Still Colombo. And if you use our method that we just talked about, the question I have for you is this. What is the social contract of that Columbo? Who is its citizen? What is its notion of value? What kind of life, what kind
in the city does it produce and how is it different from the social contract of that term? These are different forms of citizenship. They're not just different registers and designs of building or religious markets. They are different competing social contracts, normative fights about what the city should be, who it should belong to. And there are more social contracts in this image. There's one of the oldest social spatial contracts, which is the space the city gives to public infrastructure. It's one of my favorite spots in the city. Because that suburban train line that still runs by the sea. And if you go to most cities by the sea, in much of the world, the one place where public train lines don't run is by the sea. The Marine Drive in Beirut does not have a public train. Neither does it in Bombay. Neither does it in Bombay. There is also a new social contract. What is Colombo's contract with water? What is Colombo's relationship not with the man made built city, but with the land that came before we built here? And water, like the river Yamuna, is re exerting its claim on our city. Nature is demanding a new ecological contract, which will have deep social implications on us. Because the truth about it is, had the Basti that I first encountered existed, it would have flooded before the fall. And that flood, that vulnerability can't be unseen. Of course, idea of that is a very different social contract, which is perhaps not made by citizens at all. But it is a contract with capital and with trade and with powers that shape and land in spatial footprints that will never enter to all our democratic questions. Because our cities are made across space and time, and also across scale, which means that much of Colombo is determined by much of it at scales of capital far beyond a particular social contract, but their effects are felt up. One image, one city, five social contracts competing to cohabit and co-locate, all adding up in no uncertain ways. The question for Colombo, the question for us, the question for cities is what is the sum of their parts? What do they add up to? How do they compete against each other? And who's in the fight? Is this able to fight as hard as this? Is this able to say something to this. What will the water say to the port when it thinks about value? Because the port measures value very differently than the sea. We measure value very differently when we measure trade than when we measure conservation. These are the questions that cities ask at the very port. So let me tell you five stories about building the city as a social contract. And in these, what I want to tell you is stories from around the world where folks have tried to forge a different social contract. They're not silver bullets. Inequality is inequality for a reason. It is systemic for a reason, structural for a reason. But they are moves, incremental, rooted moves to fight against the breaking of a certain social contract and the chance to build a different one for us. That's what I want to tell you about today. How do you build a different social contract in our cities so we may change what happens within them? The first one is a very different way to think about that, which is to think about the social function of property. Think about the first social contract in class. Akemoni was the ex UN special rapporteur for the Dyke Sahara. She's a Brazilian architect, dean of the School of Architecture at the University of Sao Paulo. And her latest book is called Urban Warfare Housing and Cities in an Age of Finance. Mm -hmm. The questions of inequality belong to particular times. We don't live in industrial capitalism. These battles are familiar to us. There is a certain way in which capital, land, and labor come together in industrial capitalism. And our history of worker organizing. Our 
constituent of the category of labor comes from that logic of industrial capital. But we are currently in what some folks call niche capital, digital capital, financial capitalism, where the labor and the worker itself is a question mark. What is a Uber driver? A question that no less than 22 countries in the world are trying to resolve in law. Is the driver of your kidney a worker, an entrepreneur, an independent contractor? With. And that question hinges on the fact on whether the company owes this worker any recognition or any rights. And every court is answering them in a different way. But what I want to point out here is that in this current moment, that first social contract of that is very common. We live in an age in which capital has moved from industry to manufacturing for a certain time and reproduces itself through our cities. And it does it principally through real estate. Just read this one sentence 60% of the value of all global assets real estate. Within that, 75% of that 60 is residential real estate. The value of real estate and capital today in the global urban system is twice the world's GDP. This creates a very particular context for what kind of cities we make because the power of this creates certain structures of inequality. What it does is this it gives you imagination of city building that can be brilliantly rendered. If you looked at these, where would you imagine they would be from? That is Kinshasa. This is Nairobi. This is Jing. None of them look like this. None of them, let it be clear, will ever look like this. But the production of these visions of high intensity capital development as the social contract we want from our cities, as the vision we want from our cities, produces and circulates, and let's be real, very real financial capital follows these imaginations. Because the trick in real estate is they don't need to be built for money to be made. And that's the logic of financial capitalism. Without even the production of the commodity, there is profit. That's the digital nature of new capital. But what these imaginations do is they also, in our imaginations, they aren't just about capital and money. They're about a new social contract because they promise the elite the ability to leave Lagos while living in Lagos. They promise you an enclave, a township, a gated community, sound familiar? An exclusive urban estate, an exclusive residential property, just for people like you. All our cities in the world see this kind of enclave urbanism at a different scale. It may be one property in the middle of Colombo Four, or it may be Echo City, Los Angeles. The point is the promise is not just of capital and money. The promise is of elite secession. We'll give you another social contract. You don't ever have to deal with the city anymore. You don't have to go to London. You can do it right here. And when you think about that, right, you see a lot of art in my photos because if it's about social contracts, it's the only way the affect comes through. It's one of my favorite artists, Angolan Yulanji Kiahenda, who responding to these grand visions of African rendered new cities, and the Africa that you can escape, creates a large scale structure of these empty steel wire frames, mimicking the glass skyscrapers and mocking their emptiness building them out in the middle of the desert with nothing that ever fills them. The truth is, if she was an urbanist, which I think she did, she'd be right. Because we did this in India. We built exactly this kind of large scale high end real estate. And so India last year had a housing, national housing shortage of 18 million units. And we had a vacancy of 9 million. I can guarantee you that some of the nine new buildings I have seen in Colombo since I was last year will run with no less than 70% vacancy. But they are not meant 
create a social contract in place. They are not meant to embed here. They are meant to precisely the same while being here. Can you do it differently? Let me give you another story. This is the Brazilian law for the statute of the city. The Estado do Cidade. Brazil has a moment that people here will find very familiar. It's a moment of democratization, 1988, after decades of military dictatorship. And in that moment, we read to an excerpt from a time. In 1987, an alliance of social actors involved in urban issues, movements for social housing and regularization of land possession, landless movements that occupied land overnight, hundreds of families together, unions, professional associations of engineers and architects, legal assistant entities, urban squatters, NGOs, and academics joined together to formulate the popular urban reform amendment, underwritten by 250,000 signatures that went to the Congress. As a result of this action, for the first time in history, the Constitution included a specific chapter for the right to the city, making Brazil the first constitution to include the language of the right to the city as law. And its fundamental premise was that property would be measured by its social function. This is a possibility of thinking differently about the question of land and property at a moment of hyper-financialization. And the first thing they did to operationalize it was to declare a planning category for the zone of special social interest. And 10% of Sao Paulo was reserved, taken off the market, where only low-income affordable housing and social infrastructure could be built. The most important part, they took back vacant areas that were being held as real estate categories. I know how rare moments of new constitution writing are. But I also know that the seeds of this change were happening anyway. And I want you to think about the temporality of how these new social contracts are built, waiting for a moment where they may have a chance to land. Because the temporalities of movements are never singular to revolution or to quiet incremental. They're always both. Because no revolution did not have decades of small everyday movements before it. And will not survive without after. The question is when we do that work, what work should we do? This is one way to think about claiming a social contract from our city, even though it is deeply hard, precisely because of its financialization. But to imagine and ask what is the social function of property? What do our cities look like if we don't do our planning around real estate, but around the social function? I'll give you another story that begins to sum up another segment to start. Social protection systems in our city. Who gets support in this case? Beneficiaries, our new favorite word. Residents, also. And when you get that assistance from the state, do you get it as a citizen? Or do you get it as well? This word that has become so deeply tainted with questions of a moral and right? where the receipt of public solidarity becomes a moral question on your capacity or a statistical measure of your poverty, for which at some point you are held to be or lesser than your fellow citizens. So this question, the second part of it, when you think about our city, is there a way to change the language around social protection from the question of beneficiary welfare to the question of citizenship and impact. Go back to that same point. I'll give you one example of the way it works. This is the bill that just passed last week in the northwestern state of India for Rajasthan. It's called the Rajasthan Minimum Income Guarantee. The reason I'm telling you this story here is because at a time where the dominant social protection debate is on universal basic income, just give people money, it's smarter, it's more efficient. The bill refuses 
to take the rule of minimum income to cash transfer and instead guarantees for every citizen 125 days of work, the wages of which become your minimum. This is a very important distinction because this, in the language of the Act, is an entitlement based social security program. It is not a basic income as a welfare cash transfer. It is a recognition of labor and work. It is a recognition, not of contribution, but of rights, of the dignity of work that associates with social protection. And it is a recognition of a public responsibility to provide that work if the economy or the market does not provide it for you. India has had in the National Rural Employment Guarantee, one of the world's largest and longest running public works program. In COVID, without exaggeration, I can tell you that it saved hundreds and thousands of my country people who died. There is no other way to say it. Without the safety net of the Rural Employment Guarantee, the scale of devastation we would have seen, not from the disease, but from the livelihood shocks of that disease and of the pandemic. We've been saying for a very long time that COVID is not a health pandemic alone. It was an economic disaster of wage and life. It is programs like the minimum wage bill that reimagine social protection as right entitlement and dignity, and not as welfare and not as health. Give me one more. In my city, Delhi, we, unlike you guys, don't have a very good public health system. We have a very sophisticated tertiary public health system. Delhi has 12 super speciality public hospitals. Brilliant. I grew up in one. My father was a doctor in it all his life. You won't find a primary health center for love or money. So in this, our current government, the city, has moved to create what they call the Mohanlal Center. Mohalla is the word in Hindustani, again, comes from the Arabic, or neighborhood. It is local, it is rooted, it is in place. And what this intervention is, is a tiny clinic that does basic primary health care referrals, that links and starts to build a public health system, that does not seek to build specialty or expertise, but roots itself in a neighborhood where people actually live. But what I love about it the most is this. But when they started building the clinics, they realized that when you build in a city as dense and dense, there's not enough space to make a really nice, fully, properly laid out with the set, with the plot of land. Because the city's density doesn't allow it. So they did what the same workers did in the bus day I showed you in the beginning. They built wherever they could. They built incrementally. You see this Mahala clinic behind my house, which is built on a public sidewalk. It is, in every way, an illegal encroachment on public land. It is the state learning from workers how to build when there's no land to do. It is a social function of property. It is, in every way, a refusal of a logic of technical expertise and high quality modern engineering. This doesn't look fancy. It doesn't look like something you want to put on a brochure of a new construction manual. It works precisely because it's not fancy. It works because it fits into the life world in which it is meant to run. It is recognizable, it is intimate, it is friendly, it is present. And when it gets into trouble, it folds up and moves to the next sidewalk. And so the opposition government attacked the government and said, you can't break the law, you're the state. And the state government gave a response that I think is the most brilliant urban theoretical point I've heard in a long time. They said, but there is no structure. What are you talking about? It's four pieces of plywood and a tin sheet. You said that all these buses weren't real housing. This is not a structure. It's a state meant to be grand, learning, 
from the incremental building of the city's workers. It's the state taking the busty as the model for urbanism instead of taking the three dimensional engineer's drawing on the way to the track. Last two, not just Summary. A lot of the times when we think about reimagining social contracts, our debates are sort of very bipolar. Should the state do it or should the market do it? And then we get caught in these sides. I'm anti privatization. I am very anti privatization until I'm in a government meeting, at which point I want to give it to anybody other than the government. It is a very difficult fact because sometimes when you're in a department, you're like, if you're going to do it, then please hand it over to the market because nothing can be worse than that. So it's a very odd thing. But in principle, of course, public action is what you want. So the question is what's the difference between the public and the state? A non equal sociological question. Centuries of scholarship on it. But one set of people who thought about this the most are the people who think about the commons. Because the commons are precisely those that are public and collective, but neither controlled by the state nor controlled only by the market. There are many forms of this commons the cooperative enterprise, the community land trust, the the collective grazing land in our villages, the collective tree in a village that is seen to be no one's private property. We had legacies, especially in South Asia, of forms of life, of forms of land, of forms of urban living that are neither private property nor state property, but are in fact public because we made them public. And so if you think about the commons, one of the things to think about is a way in which things can be returned to the public. One type of commoning that is increasingly growing in the world is what's called demunicipalization. I want to offer this to you again as a way of thinking about other kinds of social contracts that are possible. The future is public. The future is public database. The Public Works Database is a global advocacy set of unions and activists and researchers who fight to have municipal services that were privatized water, waste, transport, and to return them to public function. Ten years ago, at the peak of neoliberal privatization, at the peak of structural adjustment, at the peak of IMF, World Bank, agreements that gave to privatize, the thought of republicking, republicizing, republication, republicking, privatized services was impossible. Something has shifted in the last 15 years. Its concentration right now, as you can see, is very much in Europe. We don't have this story. We should have this story. It's not an easy story for us because our municipalities and urban local bodies are not necessarily ready to take the work on for that public good. But the thing is, they never will be until they are responsible and have a chance to move. K.C. Shivaramakrishnan was one of our best government officers who wrote an amendment to the Indian constitution saying give more powers to the urban local bodies. Give them money, give them functionaries, let them run. Stop running our cities from higher levels of government. Everyone said they're not ready. Our local bodies are not ready. And he said they're not ready because you'll never give them a chance to try. Decentralization cannot wait for them to be ready. That cycle has to be broken. The movement for re-municipalization is an example. And so we now tell our governments, you want it to be like London, like Copenhagen, like New York, like Shanghai, excellent. Look what they're doing. They're taking back privatization contracts and re-municipalizing services. The problem with a lot of ours is we never want to see that part of New York. We only want to see Manhattan. The fact that they have a, you know, everyone in the cities really like being Singapore. I know Colombo wants to be Singapore. 80% of housing in Singapore is publicly owned. That part, no one wants to copy paste as best practice. You keep trying to get them to be like Singapore and build more public housing. Very selective, referential. But think about this idea of harmony, this idea of municipalization as a new possibility of social partner. Think also about harmony as a way that doesn't require big changes, but is an everyday act of making spaces public again when they aren't meant to be. On the left, 
is Delhi on the right, is Delhi's first priority in 2008. On the left, is Delhi's 10th most recent priority in 2023. This was not an invited public. This was a public that insurged and insisted on its presence in the city. As for people, we said, you will not write us out to social partners. And our presence in the streets of the middle of the city will remind you of the fact that you must negotiate the city's sense of itself with us in the middle of that struggle. Not all commoning requires that scale moves. Some commoning is about a change in everyday life where you occupy a street even for a minute and leave a trace of your presence and your memory there. Because the city will remember. The city will remember this, which is equally an exercise of citizenship, as was the building of the bus by two very different citizens, but both seeking to shift the social contract of the city. And the last act, which I will be, which I will speak of briefly, because I think Sri Lanka is the one place where I don't need to make the case for why memory and archiving are important, is to think about how much of our work will not stand if we allow those layers of the city to be constantly erased and forget what came before. Two archives that I am part of in my own work. On the left is Delhi's first slum map. The first time when all 780 busties were mapped, marked, measured, so that we were able to say that all 757 of our busties, 757, which had anywhere between 15 to 20 percent of our population, and remember Delhi is about 21 million at last time, occupy 0.5 5% of land. 0 0.5. 15 percent of the city, 0 0.5 percent of the land. And funny thing, there is a lot of cars. And cars sit on land. They have a very easy square footage. In the same area, where 15% of people have 0.5% of the city's land, the area under park cars is 2% of the city's land. Four times more land goes to cars than to people. Archives allow ways to reimagine social contracts and challenge certain received notions about the city we live in. On the right is a map that marks every single eviction in the city since 1990. Every red spot you see is where a settlement once stood, where workers once built housing. Every time you go, it names them. It talks about who they were. It talks about where they went. It talks about why they were moved. It talks about where that land was used for. What was that claim of public interest? The creation of these archives is a practice against inequality. With a fairly different temporality, it may not change the structural powers tomorrow, but without these archives, those structures will never be here. And the other archive that we have begun to remember and tell is the ecological archive of our city, because the water came back and insisted on being documented. And so now we look back at our cities and not just say what used to be here before. We now say, really, what used to be here before, and understand the pattern between the built and the unbuilt, the natural. Start close. If you think about urban inequality, it is very easy to feel absolutely paralyzed by the structural power of the kind of forces that produce inequality in our cities. We are not at a moment where it is easy have the slightest bit of hope about throwing rocks at these kinds of systems at 217 trillion dollars in capital that turns into real estate and shows up in the view from my room to the right. But at the same time, 
what the Basti reminds us that our work is still to remember, to think, and to move incrementally to imaginary social contract, but to do it in a way that articulates it as that, not just a pilot intervention, a development policy, a welfare regime, a new scheme, that each of the different stories, no matter how different they are, think of them as acts of building citizenship, as acts of building dignity, as acts of thinking about asking for a new social contract in the urban, and then knowing how to give it some roots that may then grow into something tomorrow. And so I'll close with three people who give me hope. Because my mother, my mother said a lot of things to me in my life, and they are always running in a soundtrack in my head. And so the current one that I have to give you, my mother said two very important things to me. As an activist, she told me, slogans can't have footnotes, which I thought was a very good piece of advice. And it made my slogan shorter, sharper, and right better. And she also told me that she does not believe in analysis that leads to paralysis. I also think it's a very good piece of very solid advice. And so what I want to suggest to you is that our action do not need to have a defined logic of scale. We may not be in a moment where we're writing a new constitution. That does not mean we don't have authorized to act. We may not be in a moment, we may be in a moment, post a moment where hope and protest was loved. Where you are now, it does not mean that that window of work has closed. Movements don't stay. They leave legacies like cities, layers like that have to be excavated and told and held on to and built upon. So three scholars. The first is queer theorist Jose Munoz. Jose Munoz was argued, writing about the radicality of hope. The present is not enough. It is impoverished and toxic for queer and other people who do not feel the privilege of majoritarian belonging, of normative taste and rational expectation. Yet let me make it clear that the idea is not simply to turn away from the present. One cannot afford such a maneuver. And if one thinks one can, one has resisted the present in favor of folly. The present must be known in relation to the alternative temporal and spatial maps provided by a perception of past and future worlds. So they offer a different read, queerness not as identity, but as horizon, a way to imagine futures that are not abstract utopias, and that do not define transformation as a denial of everything that stands to them. Instead, they ask us to dream, to rest ourselves from the present stultifying hope. We are utopic, not because we're idealistic, because being utopic is the only way to survive a present marked by inequality. Abolition movements and Black Lives Matter have a similar argument. Ruth Wilson Gilmore talks about how, while the Black Lives Matter movement may appear to be dominated by protest and critique, she reminds us that abolition is not just about absence, what we don't want, what we don't have, but about presence what we want to build, what we can imagine. It is, in Dylan Rodriguez's words, a radically imaginative, generative, social practice. And the last thinker that I turn to for hope in thinking about inequality is Gay Longer, who draws upon a history of anti-class thought in India to talk about utopia as the twinning of what she calls ecstasy and reason. Her words are better than mine, so I'll leave that to hear. Ecstasy arises because of the hope and fervent emotion aroused by the possibility of a utopian society, a society of equality and love. Reason defines the road to utopia. It analyzes the current situation of society and shows the strategy needed to build a better one. For Omlet, or Munoz, or Gilmore, the seeds of change are already present. She calls them the productive possibilities of the present. The task of thought 
of activism, of life, is to acknowledge and amplify these possibilities. It is then, she says, that utopias can unite ecstasy and reason, projecting a future that is achievable by present action. Munoz reminds us that we may often ask who this we is that is meant to in this world. This is where they give me the greatest comfort because what they admit is that the we is not yet here. There is no defined community or organization or movement that can take the mantle of life structural inequality. What Munoz tells us is the work we do is to build that we. It is to become that we. That we fight inequality not just to win or have a particular outcome. We fight inequality so that we may become part of a new social contract. That we may become that we that would hold that change. But we're not going to be that we before we start. We will only maybe be there by the time we end. So I believe, and what I want to leave you with, is to think of the urban freed from these prisons of form and materiality and narrow visions of value, to return it to the possibility of places where a new social contract can be built, and to believe in some of the stories I've told you, that there are ways in the present to get there, and to say to you that picking that fight may give you and me more than anything it may do as an outcome that we may not also evaluate our losses as movements to which, without forgetting to count what they have made us, and how no matter what happened in moments of protest, what happened in this country when people took to the streets, is that the social contract changed. The water came back to the port. And no matter how it ended, you shifted the geography of what was imaginable, of what was possible. And that we of the not yet here became actually a we that began to be present. So my appeal to you is continue to hold that ground and to reimagine it and to collectively think about ways in which that social contract can find roots in the city. And if you do, you will have many of us cheering you on, willing to walk by your side. Thank you very much for the chance for this evening today. Thank you, Dia. I think we need to be trying to find, find and identify a speaker uh, who will not just share their experiences and a framework for working through issues. Uh, and it's always been a bit of a struggle. Every year we, we try and think. Uh, who could it be? What what is really what would be useful? And the purpose has always been, I think, that not to uh, share international best practices or uh, provide an international cookie cutter uh, cookie cutter model of very complicated issues. And instead, it would be useful to highlight or uh, to highlight different possibilities to force us to ask specific questions. And above all, really to give us some hope to politically reimagine. And that is sort of what we try and do every year with the lecture. And this year, Gotham, you really have to deliver. And I think it's going to be really hard work for us to think about next year. So, uh, really, thanks for that. And yeah, as you spoke, it was really difficult not to think of that common, of how we created commons here, not just in Colombo. But across multiple urban centers uh, during the other era, when uh, people really did not just try and create a new social context, but it was really about also trying to claim public space in a way I would say we really haven't seen in this country. And your uh, closing remarks therefore really kind of took hard for us to not just think about each other's space, but just in terms of that spirit of how do we try and think of not just governance, the questions of law, questions of dissent, questions of equality, um, to really try and push that forward and not lose that space when we could politically reimagine.
So thank you for giving us that moment also. And for, in a way, through your different stories of power, of, of land, of, of citizens, of contracts with uh, government societies and environment, really try and make us ask these difficult questions as we try and work our way out of not just an economic crisis, but really a crisis of politics. Uh, and these are very important questions, and obviously questions that I hope all of us will take back so that as we drive back home, we are also looking at Colombo in slightly different ways, but also forcing ourselves to ask difficult questions about how do we think about our cities, our cities, our urban spaces, rural spaces, and above all, our citizens. Um, I just want to say a very quick thank you um, to uh, the staff at the New Mercury Travel Trust. I would like to show and introduce myself. I'm Hira Fahim. I'm a member of the board of NTP. Uh, but I'd really like to thank our uh, co executive directors, Susan and Kaushalya. And I'd also like to thank, and also thank all our staff uh, Priya, Isurimi, Hafral, Kabakran, Jifkan, Kumari. Uh, uh, Nilanta, Turanga, Shehan, I feel like I'm missing out, Dhammi. Uh, apologies if I've left out anyone. Uh, and also try and thank our board, who, uh, including Ambika, who helps us uh, steer through very difficult water sometimes, and also the other members of our board, including Chana, Shehara, Farah, and and uh, just uh, like to say, Gautam will be with us, so please join us all, refreshments outside, and uh, feel free to question him and challenge him. Uh, but above all, thank you very much. And uh, if you haven't, please pick up a copy of uh, the book on Neil and Sri Chavan that we did, and also a compilation of uh, the speakers from the last couple of years. Thank you all for coming.